I've been walking to church building Sunday morning and Sunday night for about 40 years now. And so, doing it in Colorado, I got really good at handling the cold, but it's the heat. That's the hard one, and obviously the afternoon is a little tougher than the morning. So I'm getting ready to walk down here the, tonight, well, at 4 o'clock is when I come down, and I'm thinking, it is hot, but I watched that Wim Hof video on how to keep your temperature down. So I thought, I'll just apply that. I think I need to watch the video again, because I was sweating like a pig by the time I got here. So mm. We're going to talk about the need for encouragement, and you can open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 6. We'll be there in a little bit, and the outline is in... The bulletin, it's the one you didn't use this morning if you're not sure which one. The need for encouragement. We all need a little encouragement, no matter where we're at. Heard about this guy that he had a, a mule, and he would enter that mule in the Kentucky Derby. Every year he put that mule in the Kentucky Derby, and he'd lose. He'd be far, far behind every time. Finally, somebody went to the owner and says, why do you keep doing that? You know there's no way that mule is ever going to win the Kentucky Derby. He says, yeah, I know, but the fellowship does him so much good. <laughs> that fellowship, that encouragement, that's helpful. We need to be encouraged. And so I want to talk to you about this need for encouragement. And the first point that I want to make is that encouragement is what keeps the saved saved. How important is encouragement? Well, if we want to stay saved, we need to learn how to encourage and be encouraged. We need encouragement because, number one, those who are right with God can still lose their salvation. There are those out there who teach that once you're saved, no matter what you do, you'll always be saved. There's two problems with that doctrine. One is, if you honestly believe that once you're saved, no matter what you do, there's absolutely nothing that you could do could foul up your salvation, what's the motivation for being righteous? There's none. The second problem with that doctrine is it goes so much against the Bible. The entire book of Hebrews was written to Hebrews, Jews in other words, who were thinking about leaving Christianity, they'd become Christians, to go back to Judaism. And the whole letter is written warning them, do not fall away. And the Hebrew writer says in chapter 6 of Hebrews in verse 4, For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, and have tasted the heavenly gift, and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God, and the power of the age to come, and then have fallen away. It is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God, and put him to open shame." The writer here is not talking about somebody who never became a Christian. He says very clearly, think about that person who was enlightened, who's tasted the goodness of the Holy Spirit, tasted from the Word of God. Who is that? That's believers. That's Christians. And he says, and then have fallen away. You see, those who don't believe that you can fall away, they say, well, if you fell away from the Lord, that means you were never saved in the first place. No. No. That doesn't even make sense. That's like saying if, if my phone fell off the pulpit here, that's because it never was on the pulpit to begin with. Does that make any sense to you? That's not right. The Bible says you can fall away. And if you want to know how that works, you should come to the class that, that Brother Charlie is doing where he's talking about how it's possible to fall away and how to prevent that from happening. And so make sure you, you come for that class on Wednesday nights. Great class that he's doing. But it is possible to fall away. And when we do fall away, he says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Now that does not mean it's impossible for them to come back. That's never the case, is it? As long as you're still alive, if you're still sucking air... If you fall away from the Lord, it's always possible to come back. We know that from the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son? He went away from the father. And when he came back to the father, what did the father tell him? You can't come back here. You, you, 
I don't, I don't need you as a son anymore. Is that what he said? Kill the fatted calf. Let's celebrate. This son of mine was dead, and he is alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. That's the father's attitude about a person that falls away. But it's impossible for you or I to bring them back to Christ. They've got to come back on their own. They've got to want to come back. But it's so hard if you fall away because you've essentially crucified the Son of God all over again. How did you feel when you found out that because of your sins you had crucified the Son of God? How did that make you feel? I was crushed when I discovered that, when I truly understood that. How would you like to do it a second time? The Hebrew writer is saying, when you fall away, it's like you're crucifying. You're putting him through that all over again. It's a horrible thing to fall away from God. And so we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. And the way we ensure against that is we encourage one another. Point number two, to ensure against losing our faith, we are commanded to encourage each other. Draw back a couple of chapters here to chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 and look with me at verse 12 and 13. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin <laughs> we're warned here not to develop a a sinful and unbelieving heart that would turn away or that would fall away from the living God. You know, number three, we are each responsible to be looking out for hearts that are becoming evil and unbelieving. Every member of the church, we're supposed to be looking out for the other members, watching out and seeing how is so and so doing? Is their faith slipping? And sometimes that's hard to detect, isn't it? Because we get really good at putting on the front. Putting on that show, oh, I'm fine, everything's wonderful in my life, when we know it's not. We're just kind of programmed to do that. Did you know in sign language, when you ask somebody, how are you, this is how you ask, how are you? Just that, that simple. About the only thing that you can sign back that's short is this, fine. Fine. Anything else you have to spell out. So when you see people talking in sign language, say, how are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. And we do the same thing. When we're speaking, somebody asks you how you're doing, what do you say? Oh, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. No problem at all. My life is peachy. It's wonderful. Couldn't be any better. When the truth is, we're hurting. We're hurting inside. And oh, if we could learn how to be honest and say, well, I'm glad you asked. I could use some prayers. I could use some encouragement. Isn't that a cool word? Encouragement. He says, watch out for this. Don't let that happen, but encourage one another. Number four, without encouragement, sin is more apt to deceive us. Now, deceit is a lie, is it not? Isn't that what deceit is? So if we're hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, that means sin is lying to you. And what is the lie that sin tells you? It's okay. You can go ahead and do this. You owe it to your sinful nature. That's a lie. Your sinful nature is lying to you when it tells you that. It is deceiving you. And when we slip away from God, we are more apt to give in to those sins. Because we're not getting that encouragement. We're not getting strengthened the way that we need to. Our, sin, our, our hearts become more unbelieving, a little more hardened, and we fall into that deceitfulness of sin, the deceit that this is not hurting you, it's not hurting anybody, go ahead and do it. Any of those things that you hear in that inner voice, those are lies that sin is telling you. It is deceitful. We encourage each other so that that doesn't happen. We guard against that. 
I talked about encouragement. Let me put up for you here the definition. I talked about this just a couple of months ago, but you've slept since then, so I'm going to cover it again, all right? Parakaleo is the Greek word that we translate in courage. And parakaleo is a compound Greek word. Para means beside. I think about parallel, up beside. That's what the para means. Kaleo means to call. And so parakaleo means called to one side. Sometimes God is calling us to the side of a brother or sister who needs our strength who needs our encouragement. It's a very common word in, in the Bible. 105 times this word is used in the New Testament. We're not going to read all 105 times tonight. Aren't you glad? I thought I'd get an amen for that. If we did, we would be here till midnight. Just show of hands, how many of you would stick around to midnight to hear me preach? Oh, you're lying. You wouldn't do that. <laughs> I know better than that. You're just making me feel good. Thanks for the encouragement. I appreciate it. <laughs> Parakaleo. Parakaleo. We encourage one another. B. Encouragement is one main reason we assemble. Now, I didn't say it's the whole reason we assemble. We assemble to glorify God and, and express our, our praise to Him and worship. But another big reason why we get together is so that we can encourage each other. Number one under that, when we fail to assemble, we lose an opportunity to encourage and receive encouragement. Now go to chapter 10. Go the other way here in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Listen and remember the context. The Hebrew writer is writing to those who are thinking about leaving Christianity to go back to Judaism. Look what he tells them starting in verse 19. Therefore, brethren... Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, as opposed to what? As opposed to the blood of the lambs of the Old Testament, those, the sacrifices. We have the blood of Jesus. We can enter into the holy place by a new and living way, which, is, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God... Talking about Christ as our great high priest. Verse 22, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now he says in verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another. Another translation says spur one another on. You know what spurs are for, right? Sometimes we need a little kick in the flanks, all right? We spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You see the contrast there? He says, don't give up assembling together. Don't do that. Instead, encourage one another. So what happens when we assemble together? We encourage one another. Not the only reason we assemble. Don't misunderstand me. But one of the big reasons we come together is so that we can encourage one another. Number two, encourage means to put courage back into someone. The world discourages us. We go to work, we get discouraged. We go to school, we go to, into the community. It's discouraging. We need encouragement. And that's why we assemble. And that, by the way, is why we assemble more than just Sunday morning. That's why we're here on a Sunday night. And I appreciate uh, visitors. I know we've got some visitors here who most likely were just traveling through. I said, let's stop and worship God. Man, that encourages me. Doesn't that encourage you when people do that? I think that's great. 
We meet to encourage each other. We meet on Wednesday nights for Bible class so we can encourage, so we can put the courage back into one another because we need that. When we have encouragement, uh, you're probably in Isaiah. Let me join you there. Isaiah chapter 35. I got to talking and I didn't, didn't turn to the passage here. Isaiah chapter 35. Okay, you're there. I'm here. Look at verse 1. The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the Arabah will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and a shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious heart, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save. Isaiah says, look around. You see anybody exhausted out there? You see anybody just kind of beaten down by the world? Encourage them. The world has taken the courage out of them. Put that courage back in. Strengthen them. Lift up their arms. Give them the strength and the encouragement that they are needing so badly. Because number three, the church can never have too many encouragers. We need all the encouragers we can get. We've been studying through Acts, and you may remember this in Acts chapter 4 about Barnabas. Look at Acts chapter 4 with me. Acts 4, this is when the church is just getting rolling. Things are just getting started. He says in verse 32, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. And all things were common property to them. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land and houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sale and lay it at the apostles' feet. And they would distribute to each as any had need. Now Joseph, here we go, verse 36. Now Joseph a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas, by the apostles, which, mean, which translated means son of encouragement. And who owned a tract of land and he sold it and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. This man, Joseph, somehow got the reputation that they called him son of encouragement. What do you have to do to have that kind of reputation? He encouraged a lot of people, didn't he? You can just see somebody like that. We're going to have to start calling you Barnabas. You just, everywhere you go, you're just encouraging people. You are a son of encouragement. And, and sisters, I don't know how you would translate that daughters of encouragement, but you just, you make that fit, okay? We need sisters that are encouraged too, and you do a great job. We appreciate you, sisters, all that you do. But we couldn't have too many encouragers in the church because the world has plenty of discouragers. We're around them all the time, and they drag us down. And we come here, and we're pretty beat up. And if you'll just look around in the fellowship, there's always somebody who's needing to be lifted up. There's somebody out there all the time who needs some encouragement. And there's different ways that we encourage each other. Number four. Seeing members that will go that extra mile to build up the kingdom, to me, that is so encouraging. When you see somebody and they're just going the extra mile, they're doing more than they really need to do, oh, man, that lifts my spirit. And I know for some people, just getting here takes a lot of effort. You encourage me. I know some of you got to wrestle and wrangle kids to get here every time, and it's never easy. 
God bless you for doing that. I know some of you have health problems. It's not easy for you to make it just for worship service. Just to get here. You encourage me just in being here. And then there's some that, that, that go that extra mile. That do more than they really have to do. Do things. Just anything. We have got, we got members of the church willing to do whatever it takes to build up the kingdom of God. That is so encouraging when you see people like that. You know, I think about Psalms 133, and this is a song of ascent, which means this is a, a psalm that they were singing as they were ascending the hill up to Mount Zion. I, now I'm, I'm in Psalms. I feel like I'm on, on uh, Chase's territory here. You know, it's kind of like when he's preaching out of Revelation, I say, hey now, hey buddy, that's kind of my territory there. Well, I'm in a psalm, and this is his territory. But I couldn't pass this one up because as they are ascending, these, these Jews under the Old Testament, the Psalms is their songbook. This is what they would sing as they were ascending up to go worship the God. They would sing, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. So oh, that's so special. It's so great when the brethren are together and they're unified and they're encouraging one another. And they are ascending up to go worship God and they're singing this, speaking this to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. What a beautiful thought. Let's go on to see here. See, we should also encourage outside our assemblies. I just talked about how when we assemble, we need to encourage. That doesn't mean we just encourage here. Can we do it tomorrow? Can we do it Tuesday? Can we do it Wednesday? It doesn't just have to be when we assemble. We are constantly needing encouragement because we're constantly bombarded by the discourager. The one who is attacking our faith constantly. He never quits. He never takes a day off. And so we should never take a day off from encouraging and strengthening one number one, our, uh, each other. Uh, number one, point number one. Preaching the gospel is not limited to assemblies. We know that from, from Acts chapter 14. In Acts chapter 14, it says in verse 21, After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. So here's Paul and a few other brethren, and they're going back through these cities, and they're strengthening the church everywhere that they go. Now, how did they do that? Did they hit, hit, hit uh, Lister or Iconium and say, okay, we need to encourage the brethren here, but we've got to wait till Sunday so we can have assembly. You think they did that? No, I think they went around town. They found some brethren, and they say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm glad you asked. I, I could use some prayers. Hang in there, brother. You're doing a great job. Hang in there, sister. They were encouraging one another, not just in assembly. Preaching the gospel is not limited to assembly, and neither is encouragement. It's not limited to just when we assemble together. Number two, cards, calls, emails. Throughout the week, they make life more bearable. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You know, we have a, a card ministry that some of our sisters do that Sister Elaine started, and that, that work is still going, and uh, beautiful work. How many of you have received a card of encouragement from our sisters that do that? Almost every hand is up. Should be, because I think they catch our birthdays and everything. I mean, they, they don't leave anybody out. That is a great ministry, but you don't have to be a part of that ministry to send somebody a card to send somebody an email, to pick up the phone and call somebody. Boy, sometimes those things just come at the most opportune time. Somebody calls you up, they encourage you. What a blessing that is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11 says, Therefore encourage one another and build up one another. There's a good definition of encourage. Build up one another, just as you also are doing. He says, it's not that you're not doing this. He's just saying, I want to encourage you to keep doing it. Verse 12, but we request of you, brethren, 
that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Now in that passage, if you look closely, there's a lot of different ways to put encouragement. It describes what encouragement is. One is building each other up. You say, I, I don't know what to encourage somebody in. I don't know what to say. Say something that's going to build them up. Say something that's going to strengthen their faith. Talk to somebody about how their quiet time is going. What are you studying right now in your Bible? Oh, that's a great thing. I'm, I've studied that uh, a few weeks ago, and that is really a great passage. I'm in this. I'm studying that. Those are encouraging things, isn't it? Isn't it encouraging to talk to brethren about what you're studying in the Bible? What have you been praying about lately? Is there anybody that you're trying to reach out to, get to come to church, uh, sharing your faith with somebody? Oh, that's encouraged. Build them up as you're doing that. He says in, in verse 12, appreciate those who diligently labor among you. You see somebody doing something in the church? Go up to them and say, man, I appreciate what you do. I, I appreciated Johnny's prayer this morning. That was a beautiful prayer, brother. Great prayer. I love that. See, just little things like that just mean so much. Take the time to encourage, to, to let somebody know you appreciate them. Verse 13, that you esteem them very highly. I heard a brother this morning tell another brother, he says, I want to stand up and shake your hand because I esteem you. I, I think I appreciate you for what you do for the church. And you are important in this body. Oh, that built that brother up. Just taking the time to say those words of encouragement. Little things that we can do. He says in verse 14, encourage the faint-hearted. Do we have any members of this congregation that are faint-hearted right now? I'll bet you we do. And if you'll just look around, you should use a little discernment, pay attention, you'll know who they are. And you're going to know that they need some encouragement. We need to encourage one another. Up here on the slide, and we looked at the scripture already, but Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. This scripture says we only encourage each other when we're assembled on Sunday, right? That's not what he says. Day by day. If it's called today, you should be encouraging each other. Now, tomorrow is not called today yet, but when we get there tomorrow, it, we're going to call it today, aren't we? We should be encouraging each other. When we get to Tuesday, we're going to call that today. We should be encouraging each other. You get the idea. All the time, constantly seeking to encourage one another. In fact, this last point, I want to encourage you to make a plan to encourage someone each day this week. Now, I'm not insisting. I'm just throwing this out here. Here's an idea. Think of a way each day you could encourage somebody. And what I did, because I, I always try to practice what I preach. You know, I, I try. I wrote down in my calendar on my phone a name of a person I want to encourage each day this week. I wrote down a name of somebody that I think could use some encouragement. And I'm, gonna, I'm making a plan. Some of it I've already written in what I'm going to do. I'm going to call them or I'm going to see them or, or do something or, or maybe send them a note. Different things that you can do each day. But just take that time. That won't take you a lot of time, will it? You got time to do that, don't you, this week? Just take a moment each day, send somebody a text, give somebody a call, give somebody a visit. It won't take very long. Just encourage somebody. Think of somebody. And, and let me encourage you to... Try to think of somebody that doesn't get a lot of encouragement. Sometimes the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and I'm glad it does. But we got some members that are pretty quiet, that are not likely to show that they're needing encouragement. But they need it worse. They need it worse than some of those that are more vocal about their need. And so be conscious of that.
Look for those people who really need some encouragement. Can we do that? Just nod your head yes if you think you can do that this week. Let's go out and let's really encourage one another because we need that strength and that encouragement. I want to encourage you with this invitation song that we're going to sing. If you're needing some prayers and some encouragement right now, one of the best ways to do it is to respond to the invitation. To come up and ask. Say, hey, I need some strength and I need some encouragement. And we will give you that. I'll guarantee you this congregation will pray for you. We'll love up on you. We will remember you all week long in prayer. And this is a great opportunity to do that. If you're outside of Christ and you'd like to come to Christ, this invitation is for you as well. Please come as we stand and sing.